My name is Luis Barroso, and thank you for coming here and helping me uh, welcome uh, Jonathan Kumi to Google today. Um, many of us here have known John for a very long time because uh, you know, Google and, and many of us share that passion for understanding the impact of computing technology in the world. Uh, and John's been working on this for a very long time. For those of you who are not in the audience and are from Google and therefore are tired of knowing this, uh, Google has cared about the energy efficiency and our impact on the environment for, for quite a while. Um, I believe Google's been carbon neutral since 2007. Um, I've, we have by now invested nearly a billion dollars in renewable energy products and we have been able to share with the industry and the academic community some of our findings in how we are able to achieve a very high efficiencies in our data centers as well. Now, John has been a very influential figure in this field uh, at least over the past decade or so. Uh, and even though uh, his very data-driven approach may be considered a little bit old-fashioned these days, given how quickly some of our political candidates divorced themselves from, from factual data. Uh, 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 John really likes uh, data and he likes principled analysis. Some of you may be familiar with some of the studies he did that are closer to what we do here at Google, estimating energy consumption of servers and data centers. Uh, to both studies, the one in 2007 as well as one, uh, another one last year, are very widely uh, cited and, and respected as uh, good data points uh, in this area. John is here today to talk about uh, computing energy efficiency. You see the title, The Computing Trend that will change everything. After many years at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, he has just joined, uh, let me make sure I said it correctly, Steyer. The Steyer Taylor a Center for Energy Policy and Finance at Stanford University as a research fellow. He has co-authored dozens of research publications. Uh, at this, he's been the single author of at least two books, one of which is recent and it's here right now, uh, Cold Cash, Cool Climate. We happen to have copies of the book here available uh, uh, for purchase after the talk, and John will be happy to sign them. Please help me in welcoming John Kumi. Luis, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. So in the technology industry, there's always a lot of loose talk about revolutionary change. I'm convinced that we're on the cusp of a revolution worthy of the name. And it's one driven by the energy efficiency of computing and communications. Th those trends in, in the efficiency of these uh, devices are enabling uh, a proliferation of gadgets that are cheap, that are smart, that are small, that are connected, and are so low power that oftentimes they can scavenge the energy they need from ambient energy flows. So as an example of what's becoming possible, this is a company called Proteus Biomedical. They've created a one cubic millimeter device that goes inside a pill. This pill in its current incarnation is a placebo pill that's taken along with other medications. When it hits your stomach, the digestive juices in your stomach allow it to generate just enough power to send a signal to a patch that you have on your skin, near your stomach. And that then tells the doctor when you took your pills. Now, for most of us, it's not a problem to remember when to take your pills, but there are uh, large classes of uh, uh, populations where you actually need to know this. And for certain kinds of diseases, this is very, very important. So this is a tiny thing. It uses very little power. It scavenges the energy it needs from your, your internal workings. And it will transform, ultimately, as, as more sensors are added to this kind of device, it will transform the way we understand the human body. So this is just one of many examples. I'm in the process of compiling case studies of different technologies and business models that are enabled by the trends that I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of this discussion. So the research question that I wanted to answer was how has the energy efficiency of computing changed over time? At the end of the talk, I'll, I'll discuss 
what I think some of the implications are of that, and I'll ask for your help because all of you have lots of interesting ideas that I don't know about on technologies and business models that uh, are potentially relevant. So if you have examples for me, by all means, come up after the talk or uh, send me email. So everyone knows about Moore's Law. It's not a law in the physical sense. It's an empirical observation about economics of chip production. In 1965, he, he looked at, Moore, Gordon Moore looked at the, uh, the trends in the production of chips and he found that the component density was doubling roughly every year. In 1975, he revisited that because of changes in the economics. The trend moved towards doubling every two years. And that trend in density has held for more or less the last 30 plus years. Now it's, it's a characterization of the economics of chip production, not physical limits. And it's often imprecisely cited. So for those of you interested in understanding how this, the law, as it's uh, precisely stated, evolved over time, there's a great article by Mollick in 2006 in the IEEE Annals that I heartily recommend. So this is Moore's original graph. And on the y-axis, we have the relative manufacturing cost per component. On the x-axis, the number of components per integrated circuit over time. Each of these curves is a snapshot in a particular year. And the minimum point of this curve is the point of uh, lowest cost production. As you can see over time, the, the cost per component goes down. And from the progress in the minima of these curves, we get uh, what's now known as Moore's Law. This has led to more popular presentations of this. This is a graph most of you have seen. Number of transistors per chip over time. And this is uh, from data uh, from James Laris. It's uh, from 71 to 2006, the doubling time is about 1.8 years for transistor density. So originally, when I started looking into this question of trends in, in uh, efficiency, I wanted to replicate some work I had done for servers, where I looked at energy, efficient, energy uh, use, costs, and performance. In the research for this later work, I actually found a, a great article by uh, Bill Nordhaus, who's an economist at Yale. And his, uh, most of his academic work is actually in the climate area. He's done a, a great deal of work on the economics of climate mitigation. But he's also an aficionado of the history of computing. And he compiled a long-term trend in, in performance and costs for computing that I was able to, to build upon. So once I found that work, I realized that it didn't make sense for me to go into the cost side. but Instead, I wanted to focus just on energy and performance. So I started looking into this. This was my uh, calculation uh, from two computers that I had at my house. I had some data on uh, the cost of the, the old IBM PC XT80 and uh, the cost of ENIAC. So this was just kind of exploratory. It looks more or less like a straight line on a, on a log plot. That's fine. That's cost. Calculations per second per dollar of purchase cost. Then I made this graph, computations per kilowatt hour, similar sort of picture. But it was this graph that really set me down the path to understanding what was going on with efficiency of computing. So my friends at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab who run their supercomputer group, they had some estimated data on the power use and performance of their devices. So they had a Cray-1 back in the day. Uh, these NERSC machines are a set of gradually more powerful supercomputers that they had uh, installed at the lab. And that, that really piqued my interest and said, OK, maybe if I fill in data in this graph, we'll learn something interesting and important. So the method that I used here was to focus on the peak performance of the computers and the energy use at peak performance. So number of computations per hour at full load divided by the measured electricity consumption at full load, so full load, full computing load, full uh, maximum performance. So this says nothing about the machine powering down. This is all about the active performance at highest, uh, highest output as well as the energy use at that period. So I, the, when you see computations per kilowatt hour, that's what, that's what this means. Now the, the nurse data, it turns out I didn't actually end up using those data because they're not measured. So every point on the graph that I will show you is measured data for electricity consumption. 
and performance that's been normalized to uh, Nordhaus's uh, database or taken directly from it uh, for purposes of the, of the performance side. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, published data on power use. There's a great set of reports that was done for the Office of Naval Research by uh, Wyke in 55, 61, and 64. Uh, that was back in the day when you could actually count the number of computers there were, and there were dozens or, or low hundreds. Uh, I also uh, visited various archives and people who had old computers. In general, when I was doing these measurements, uh, the computer was fully utilized uh, for portables. There are a few in the database. I subtracted out the screen power. Now, it's an important caveat. All of you know this, uh, but actual performance trends with real software in use are not necessarily the same as performance trends as measured from benchmarks, and those are not the same as transistor trends. There's often a lot of confusion in the popular discussion of this, important to state that up front. Now, in the PC era, starting with microprocessors, performance per computer uh, doubled more or less every year and a half. So this is something that I call the popular interpretation of Moore's Law. When you talk about Moore's Law with most folks, that's what they say but more, to my knowledge, never talked about performance, just density of components. This is a graph of uh, computations per second per computer, the maximum computing output for a variety of different devices over time. Most of these data come from the Nordhaus work. There's, a, there's a several dozen more that I added to the, the database, but you can see a clear upward trend, as you'd expect. You also see this interesting result here. In 1960, around the time of the shift to transistors, you start to see a bit of a jump in performance. And we'll see that again in the, in the efficiency curve as well. So I did uh, a variety of measurements on different computers. I visited the Microsoft Computer Archives, which is a temperature and humidity controlled vault that has many old computers, including original Mac, uh, Fat Mac, original uh, IBM PCs, a variety of other devices. Uh, I crawled under the desks of uh, some of my colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab because they had dozens of computers that I could easily get access to. My in-laws are photographers. They had some high-powered computers as well. And then we'll see in a second, uh, Eric Klein is a history of computing buff, and he had a, a variety of computers in his own archives that I couldn't find anywhere else. The Computer History Museum here in Mountain View, I'm sure all of you have visited there. If you haven't, it's an amazing resource. And there's still lots of online activity from people who are aficionados of old computers. And so people who actually understand how vacuum tubes work were very patient in educating me uh, as to the subtleties. So does anyone know this computer? Recognize this? Uh, Altair. Altair 8800. So this was a kit computer. It appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics in 1976, and it sold tens of thousands of units. It was the first recognizable personal computer, it looks a lot different than what we're used to nowadays. How about this one? Osborne, yes. This is, this, this is what passed for a portable computer. I'd say luggable is more like it. The screen is about four inches. Diagonally, it's a monochrome screen, and you had to plug it in. So it was really for people who were using it on site. They had power. They needed to carry a computer with them. This one's obvious, uh, an old Apple II. Brings back memories. I did my senior thesis in college on an Apple IIe. So uh, this is just uh, this is Eric Klein. He has a, a garage full of old computers, some of which I just showed you. So this is uh, the bottom line result from that analysis. The efficiency of computing, defined as the number of computations you can do at full load, div divided by uh, the kilowatt hours uh, used during that same period, has doubled more or less every year and a half since the 1940s, so longer than Moore's Law, starting with vacuum tube computers. This results in about a hundredfold improvement every decade in the efficiency of computing. And in essence, this trend enabled the existence of laptops and smartphones. So for the statistics whizzes in the audience, uh, good correlation here, R squared of 0.98 for all computers, 0.97 for PCs, T statistics are good as well. Uh, Eric Benjolfsson is a friend at MIT. Uh, I, I ran my regressions past him just to make sure I had done it right, and he said, yeah, it all looks good, and damn, I, look, I wish my regressions looked like that too. 
Uh, doubling time for computations per kilowatt hour, 1.6 years or so for all computers, 1.5 years for PCs, and slightly faster improvement in efficiency uh, during the vacuum tube era. There's a big jump, as you can see, when we switch from tubes to transistors. So typically, for on a per switch basis, transistors are 10 to 20 times more efficient than tubes. Uh, but what you see here is, is a, uh, about a two order of magnitude, maybe a little more uh, jump in the efficiency. And what I think is going on there, it's not just having more efficient transistors, but it's also uh, innovation in the way people were using and designing these devices that led to an increase in performance. So not as many uh, devices in the discrete transistor era, but then of course, by the time we got to microprocessors, there are a lot more computers to, to measure. So here are some summary implications. The things you do to improve performance, at least over the period I analyzed, almost invariably improve computations per kilowatt hour. So for transistors, you make them smaller. You have a shorter distance from the source to the drain. You have fewer electrons in the transistor. That all reduces power use. For tubes, it's a similar story. You make them smaller. They have lower capacitance, lower currents. That all reduces uh, power use as well. The trends that I'm describing here make mobile and distributed computing ever more feasible. So if you think about it in terms of a device that has a battery, the battery life improves 100-fold per decade at constant computing power. So this is one example of the result of this, these trends. Uh, so this is installed base of personal computers, laptops and desktops. In 2009, for the first time, according to IDC data, laptops outsold desktops. So this, is, this graph shows installed base, but just to give you the, the perspective here, laptops outsold desktops in 2009, and they will continue to do so going forward. So this trend towards more and more laptops in the installed base is only going to, to continue and increase. This is another interesting example. This is the full belly, sorry, the big belly trash compactor. And this is an example of uh, both computing and communications reducing environmental impacts in other parts of a business process. So these are installed typically in parks, places where a truck needs to go around and pick up the garbage. And first off, it compacts the trash five times. So right off, that's five times fewer trips for the big garbage trucks. But it also, it sends a text message when it's full. So it's actually better than an 80% improvement. And uh, it generates its, its own power from a photovoltaic panel on top. So self-powered device would not be possible without very efficient uh, uh, information technology as well as efficient compacting. So this is an economic and environmental home run, clearly. Uh, what it does is it allows you to substitute bits for atoms. And any time you can do that, almost invariably that improves environmental performance. So here's another example. I'm going to visit these folks on the 17th of September, uh, Josh Smith at uh, University of Washington. He used to be at Intel. He's designed sensors that scavenge energy from stray radio and TV signals. So in active mode, these are using 60 microwatts. Uh, for, for similar kinds of devices, there are other possible power sources, so light, heat, motion, uh, bodily fluids, as we talked about. Uh, but, but clearly, by the time you start getting useful computing work being conducted at the microwatt level, you're starting to imagine, you can start to imagine applications that we could never ever do before. And that's ultimately what I think the source of the revolution will be. So other implications here, there's a lot of focus on big data, but uh, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson at MIT likes to talk instead about nano data, data that's focused on specific transactions and specific individuals. And our ability to do very detailed monitoring of transactions and characteristics of, of people and institutions will actually give us great insight and visibility into what's going on there in a way that we never could before. We'll have uh, ever more precise control of processes. We'll have uh, better ability to do real-time analysis of what's actually happening in the world. And uh, it will, of course, enable the Internet of Things to come about. So bottom line on the implications here, we'll have better matching uh, of energy services demanded with those supplied. So 
people always talk about the end of Moore's Law, and Luis and I were talking earlier about the end of Bernard scaling. Uh, most folks, when they talk about that, they talk about it from the perspective, the perspective view, saying here's our technology as we have it now. We're seeing real problems in how we implement this going forward and increase densities and increase performance. What are we going to do to fix that? I'm going to take a different view here using the historical perspective here. Back in 1985, Richard Feynman, the physicist, he calculated a theoretical limit to the efficiency of computing. Now, he did it by making an assumption. He said, let's assume a three atom transistor. If I do that, using my computational wizardry, I can come up with the, the ultimate physical limit for, for computing. He did that. I plotted it on this curve. So here's that same graph that we saw. If you were to extrapolate the trend out to that physical limit, it would take us out about three decades, so to 2041 or so. What this graph tells you, and it's the same story that you're getting from the folks who are worried about the NART scaling, is that sometime in the next few decades, we are going to have to radically change how we do computing. So this take comes at it from the theoretical limit perspective rather than looking at our current technology. Now, one interesting little clever tidbit, earlier this year, researchers at Purdue, the university, not the chicken company, and the University of New South Wales created a reliable one atom transistor. It uses electron energy levels within one atom to do switching. Now, it runs at liquid helium temperatures, <laughs> but what it says is that if we're, you know, if, if we, again, can radically change how we do this computing, then there's a potential for much higher efficiencies. But again, we're going to have to change what we're doing. So there are some big unanswered questions here. One to me is, are there innovations either in software and hardware that uh, will allow us to substantially exceed this historical rate of change in the efficiency of computing? Conversely, what roadblocks might get in the way and prevent the trends from continuing after this current innovation pipeline of the next five to 10 years is exhausted? And then, of course, what do we do after we reach Richard Feynman's theoretical limit or the one atom transistor limit? Uh, obviously, you know, I don't have the answer to those questions. But I want to I summarize what I think some of these, uh, the, the big picture implications are. So it's not just about computing efficiency. Low power actually is more important than efficiency. You can make slightly less efficient devices that are, that are really low power that perform useful computing service, you can put them in places like pills or in you know, every, every device here giving an, an IP address to the lights and other things that, that don't need to be connected by wiring. Um, the revolution that I'm talking about is being driven by a confluence of trends. So it's the efficiency of computing, but also the efficiency of communications and the efficiency of sensors. So as we get MEMS devices that can do sensing at very low power levels, then you get all sorts of interesting things that we couldn't do before. And then, of course, efficiency of controls. As soon as you start getting these really low power devices, energy storage becomes really important, and the energy harvesting becomes important as well. In most of these devices, the bulk of the electricity use is actually in idle mode. So the active power is not the most critical thing in, in many cases, it's actually how fast can you put the device to sleep and how low can you make the, the power use go. So the engineering challenges are different from building the fastest computer at its, at its peak output. That's a very different set of engineering challenges than building one that is elegantly simple, that powers down quickly, that has very low idle power. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of elegant simplicity that's a little different than the focus on uh, ever more uh, powerful, active mode performance. So let me just summarize results here so we leave time for questions. Uh, in the PC era, the performance per computer doubled every year and a half. The efficiency of computing also doubled every year and a half during that period. So those things are, are connected. Uh, from ENIAC to the present, computation per kilowatt hour doubled more or less every uh, 1.6 years. And the things you do to improve performance also almost invariably improve energy efficiency of computing. We're far from the theoretical limits, but as all of you know, there are some uh, technological challenges that we're facing in the coming years. Uh, the biggest implications of these 
uh, trends is, is for mobile technologies, distributed technologies that uh, are small and cheap and, and connected. And the focus now, not just in the popular press, but in the engineering world, is a focus on low power. Figuring out ways to make tiny, cheap, low power devices that can be self-powered and put in places that we never could imagine putting them before. And that's, as I said, a different set of engineering challenges. Some of the best engineering talent in the world is now focusing on that area, and I think great things will come from that. So uh, my uh, three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old twins have better Spanish pronunciation than I do, but viva la revolucion. Uh, this is where I want to ask for your help. So if any of you are aware of technologies, business models, companies doing interesting work enabled by ultra low power, ultra high efficiency, energy scavenging devices, I would like to hear about it. So come up after the talk, send me email, and let me know what you're thinking. With that, I will say thanks to my funders and co-authors and ask any, answer any questions that you have. Have you done any comparisons between the rise in efficiency and the rise in the total energy use of computers? So the question is, uh, have I looked at the relationship between the rise in efficiency and the rise in total energy use of computers? The most recent work that I've done on total energy use is in data centers alone. So I haven't uh, done careful analysis on the whole IT picture. That's, I think, what you're getting at, right? Because as you have more and more distributed devices, there's more energy associated with these different uh, de uh, devices. So uh, back in 2000 or so, there were a couple of guys running around talking about how the internet was going to use half of all electricity in 10 years. And we did pretty careful analysis to summarize for PCs and all office equipment and data centers, everything else. The number for the US was around 3% of all electricity use. My bet is that that's a little higher now, but it's probably still single digit percentage because we're, what, what's happening is we're at the same time as we're increasing our usage of computing, we're also starting to shift towards technologies that are more efficient. So shift away from CRT screens, shift towards laptops, more computing being done on handheld devices. So you have countervailing trends. It's, it's clear that, there, that things, we're using a little more electricity for IT than we did in 2000, but it's not exploding in the same way as the amount of information services is exploding. One of the, we're looking at these uh, from a technology standpoint. Uh, you sort of understand the economics of this better than I do. Uh, like uh, Chuck Moore, another Moore, not that one, uh, uh, architect at uh, AMD, um, used to talk about um, this uh, virtuous cycle in computing in which uh, new technology was created that created devices that were fairly amazing and then those devices had a market value that allowed you to get a lot of money to invest in new technology, right? And these sort of kept going forward. At the time that he mentioned that for the first, uh, he was concerned that uh, them being in the PC business, that uh, perhaps computers are fast enough and therefore this virtuous cycle would end due to the fact that uh, it was harder and harder to create new value on top of what they had mm. sort of at that point. What, what, do you, what, what do you think of that? So, so the question relates to uh, the idea that, that somehow you're, as you, uh, you reach kind of a saturation in the performance of, the, or sorry, the need for people's, for computing for people, that, that the PC business in particular would be affected. By this, that's one way to. to that's, that's one example. It's one example. So what I what I think you're seeing is devices that are coming closer and closer to tasks. So the PC is a general purpose device, and I think we have saturated for most folks. You know, my mom using email, we she doesn't need much more performance, right? But what we do need is distributed performance, distributed computing that is much closer to the actual tasks that we're trying to perform and can help us make decisions in real time. You aren't gonna carry your desktop computer with you all around, but you have your phone. And so I think, I don't think it's, it's going to result in a, a slower innovation path or less value. It's just gonna be value to different companies. Companies who are able then to, to create innovation for particular sets of users, for particular kinds of tasks, 
and deliver that innovation to folks who, who need it. So a, a strange example, I saw a scale that, ha that is connected via Wi-Fi to the internet. I have that. You have that scale, okay. <laughs> so this is a very interesting thing because how much do you think a, a scale costs, so just a normal scale? 20. 20 bucks, 30 bucks. How much do you think they sell these scales for? $100. $100, okay. So here is an example where the, this is pretty much the same device. It has a very, you know, some chips in it, a few other little things that maybe cost five or 10 bucks, but they're delivering customer value that makes you want to pay 100 bucks for it. So you can't lie about your weight anymore. Uh, but, but you have, you know, automatically it comes up to the cloud and it, it you know, creates a, a nice graph for you of what's happening over time. So I think that's an example where the customer value that you're creating is because you're really close to their need for information and their decision. And that's a different thing from creating a general purpose computing device. I think we're going to really focus much more on that need for uh, specific focus on specific tasks. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I had a quick question for you. Uh, could you comment on the trends in uh, the chemical batteries? Uh, chemical batteries? Chemical like, batteries. Um, I can see that there's like this on a log scale, you have this straight line for uh, computing power increasing over the decades. Uh, but what's been the situation with the uh, batteries and innovation in chemical batteries? Okay, so the, so the question is uh, on the rate of innovation in chemical batteries. And obviously the trends there, are, the changes are much slower. So we're starting to see people, and that's going to be part of the, the case study work that I'm doing is to show those trends as well over time uh, for batteries, but much, much slower. And what, because the computing trends improve so fast, we're getting now into the regime where current battery chemistries can allow us to create really small devices. So we're getting a little bit better, and as people focus more on, for example, uh, lithium ion batteries and other similar technologies for cars, we're starting to see real R&D going into this in a way, you know, 40 years ago there just wasn't that kind of R&D going into batteries in the same, at the same scale. So I, I think there will be improvements there, but the, because the computing trends improve so fast, that's where most of the, the change is going to happen, and it will start to bring more and more applications into the realm of feasibility for certain battery chemistries. You're also starting to see people playing around with, uh, flu with flow batteries and fuel cells and other things like that. And so I visited MIT about a month and a half ago, and uh, one of their scientists there showed me a device they were going to use for a, a space mission. The only way they could get it to operate for five years was a little fuel cell. No battery technology was going to do it. And so I, I think that there's certainly a trend, you know, there's ways to improve the battery chemistry stuff, but it really the action is on the electronic side. So I think you mentioned this a little bit already, but um, I was wondering if you could say more about the, the, the trends that we've seen in, in both aggregate energy consumption and the, the use of, of electronics and computers and things like that as a relative percentage of that. And also the, the, the trade-offs in, in energy consumption we see as more and more things go virtual and go online and go to the cloud. Do you, do you have data or research on either of those things? Okay. Like, like I'm thinking, for example, in my home, um, you know, I've got a lot more gadgets now than I used to, but you know, the total power I use in my house hasn't changed that much over time. And the bulk of it is, you know, goes to lighting and, and appliances and things like that that are completely different technologies. So you, so you have a bunch of things going on there. So the, the right. question relates to what have been these kind of aggregate trends in total electricity use and how does that relate to our increased use of computing technology. Right. So my, my best guess now is we're talking single digit percent in the U.S. for total direct electricity used by IT equipment. Uh, but what you're seeing is, set, let's, let's call it, five or six percent. You've got that five or six percent of direct electricity used for computing, a couple percent of that is data centers. Uh, but we also have the other 95 percent, which is being affected, in many cases, by the IT equipment. And you also have the rest of fuel consumption, non-electricity consumption, potentially affected as well. And so I think it's, it's important to track the total electricity used by IT, I think it's something I've done, you know, something I've done for a long time. I think it's important to do, but I think it's also important to try to understand the effect of that IT on the rest, the other 95%. And that, to me, is the is the more interesting 
questions. So one example that I did, uh, that I worked on recently, relates to a trade-off between buying music on a CD versus downloading it. And we found that even in the, the, the best case for CD, sending a CD, the, compared to the worst case for downloading, that it was still a 40% savings. And it's much likely to be in, in emissions, much likely to be more than that. So, so I think that, that, that it's important to start to do more and more case studies like that to understand these systemic effects. Because the direct electricity use, while important, is not something we should be getting very excited about. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's a pretty good use for the electricity, in my view. And on the data center side, you've got, let's just call it 90% of data center floor space is in-house data centers in companies whose main business is not computing. It's, in general, very, very inefficient. Utilization for servers of 5 to 15%. Uh, number of comatose servers not doing anything, but still using electricity, 20, 25, 30% of the servers. Huge inefficiencies there. As there'll be a shift more towards cloud implementations, there will be actually a reduction, an increase in the efficiency of producing those services a reduction in energy use. So there's a huge potential for improvements in data centers simply by shifting towards a more efficient way of delivering the services. So there's a lot of moving parts in this, but I, you're asking the right question. I just think the focus really needs to be on the other 95% and what the IT can be doing for that. When you mentioned 5 to 6% uh, usage by IT, does that count the, the cooling of those data centers? Or yes. is it? So the 2% so for data centers, 2% for data centers includes everything related to the infrastructure, okay, cooling, fans, pumps, everything like that. I had a similar question about your data set that spanned many decades. Did you try to make, uh, include in some way the cooling or other overhead outside of the, you know, the ENIACs and yeah, the so that, giant okay, early so machines? Okay, so that's a good question. Actually, for this particular set of trends, I did not include cooling because I wanted to get at the characteristics of the IT equipment itself. I wonder if the uh, the effective efficiency doubling time for some periods of history has actually been much shorter. Well, it's a good yeah. it's a good question. I think that. Uh, there's been changes in the way that those services have been delivered yeah. that, that would be hard to track. But I agree, it's something that should be looked at. Have you looked at the delivered computation as opposed to the, the computational efficiency? In particular, what I'm thinking of is the software efficiency. You know, 20 years ago, I had a window manager that was about as responsive as the one today, but it takes way more instructions. Yeah, so, so the question relates to looking at software efficiency as opposed to hardware. And this is actually, to me, this is a fascinating area because in the past, we've mainly thought of performance as a question of hardware. We said uh, Intel will give us or AMD will give us more performance. We just don't have to worry about our code. Well, I think that's changing, particularly as the need for parallelism. You know, you have a lot of cores. You have to change your software. It's very important. Turns out that there are, there are big potential gains there. There are some folks at LBL who have looked at what's called co-design of software and hardware. And this is a term that comes from the embedded system space, but they're starting to apply it to the supercomputer space because when they came to Steve Chu when he was the director of the lab there and said, our new supercomputer is gonna use 200 megawatts. And they said, Steve Chu said, no, go back and redesign it. And they started to look at ways to co-design the software and hardware, and they were finding you know, two orders of magnitude improvement in the efficiency just because they optimized the, the software and the hardware together to attack certain kinds of problems. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that, and it's really true. I think everyone here has a story about how you know, we were doing the same basic thing using a whole lot more cycles. And part of what I think goes on is that the costs of inefficient code are not being brought to bear on the people who are designing it. And as soon as you can get to the place where someone selling data center services is able to give that information to the people using the services, when we get to that point, then you're gonna to start to see much more optimization. We're not there yet, but you can imagine it being done given technology that, that exists today. And that's, that's where I think we need to get to so that people actually understand the true total cost of a computing cycle when they're using it. And then they'll change their behavior. Thanks to all of you.